Nahum says, the mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Think about that as we sing, mighty to save.
Gracious Father, we are grateful to be in your presence again this Lord's Day. It is always a joy and delight to be together with the family of God, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, who are there for each other, to pick each other up in our time of needs. And, uh, and with that in mind, we think this morning of Jeff and uh, the family as they go through a very trying time. And as a church, I know there's much concern. There's much prayer and much desire to stand in the gap and uphold them in prayer and even in uh, perhaps financial needs, whatever may be necessary. We pray, Father, that you would just uphold Jeff and, and strengthen him as he's feeling quite weak. Just be with them at this time. We think of these other folks in the bulletin, Lord, and uh, I, I'm not 100% sure what is going on with each of them, but Lord, we know that you can be close to us in every situation. That you can uphold us in your grace. That we may find peace in the midst of trials and struggles. You don't promise to keep us from these things, but to walk with us through those difficult times. Be with these folks, I pray this <coughs> day. We think of the Waddell family today as there are new missionaries for the new month. And we pray that you would uphold them in the Philippines and their work they're doing for you there. And bless them, be with their children as a, they have quite a household there of kids. And I'm not sure if the children have to go away to school or not, but uh, it's quite a sacrifice for the whole family. Just be with them, bless them, make their work fruitful and multiply their work we pray and may many people come to know you through their work as well. Lord, I pray for the deacons of this church and um, as they strive to be good leaders and examples of Christ uh, in our midst. We pray your blessing upon them and as we come to the table of the Lord a little later today, we look forward to partaking <coughs> in something that unites us together in Jesus Christ that you have called all who know you as the Lord and Savior to come to this table, the table of the Lord. And we look forward to that day that we can join you in glory and partake one more time at the table. We ask, Father, as we come to the Word of God at this time, that you would just uh, enlighten us and open our hearts and minds to hear from you. Uh, may the message uh, just be active in our lives. May we hear from you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I've encouraged you to bring your Bibles, and if it's not, if you don't have one, I'm sure it's on the overhead. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 1 today, and Angela's going to come and read. This letter is from Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle in Christ Jesus. It is written to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May grace and peace be yours, sent to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to him, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the wonderful kindness he has poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved son. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his son and our sins are forgiven. He has showed us kindness he has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. It is a plan centered on Christ, designed long ago according to his good pleasure. And this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us from the beginning, and all things happen 
just as he decided long ago. God's purpose was that we who were the first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. And now you also have heard the truth, the good news that God saved you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us everything he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. This is just one more reason for us to praise our glorious God. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for Christians everywhere, I have never stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the wonderful future he has promised to those he called. I want you to realize what a rich and glorious inheritance he has given to his people. I pray that you will begin to understand the incredible greatness of his power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else in this world or in the world to come. And God has put all things under the authority of Christ, and he gave him this authority for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is filled by Christ, who fills everything, everywhere, with his presence. Thank you, Angel. And we are may be surprised, I'm not looking at Ephesians chapter 1 this morning, but it kind of fits the whole theme of what I'm going to talk about for the next little while. So for the next several weeks, we're going to have one chapter of the book of Ephesians read each Sunday, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy just listening to God's Word. I read a silly little story this week that I thought I would share with you, because it fits well with what I'm going to say. Imagine for a moment... A typical macho man in college. Let's call him Biff. <laughs> Lovely name. And Biff is into the whole college scene. He sees himself as a skin wrap patch of salivary glands, taste buds, and a wonderful sex drive. So how does Biff occupy his time with that kind of self uh, perception of himself. Why? Eating and chasing girls, of course. That's what Biff liked to do. He eats everything and anything in sight without regard for their nutritional value or the big waistline he will inherit in the near future. And he chases just about everything in a skirt. But he has a special gleam for this luscious looking Susie over in the, uh, uh, in the cheerleading section. One day, Biff was chasing little Susie around, cat, with, around campus when the tr track coach got a, a glimpse of him running. And he said, hey, man, can this kid ever run? And when the coach finally caught up with Biff, he said, why don't you come out and try out for the track team? <laughs> nah, Biff said. Watching Susie out of the corner of his eye, being distracted by the coach, he says, I'm too busy. But the coach wasn't going to take that nah for an answer. And after a little bit of persuasion, he finally convinced Biff, Biff to at least give it a try and try out for the track team. So Biff started working out with the track team, and Biff discovered, hey, you know what? I can run fast. And in time, Biff slowly started changing his eating habits, and he started to go to bed at a proper hour, and his skills began to improve. And in time, he found he even started winning some races and posting some personal best, and he had some excellent times in his events. And finally, Biff was invited to the big race day at the state tournament. 
And he arrived at the track early to stretch, warm up, and focus his energies on the task ahead of them, ahead of him. Then, just a few minutes before the race, guess who shows up? Sweet little Susie. <laughs> and boy, did she look beautiful and more desirable than ever. And she pranced up to Biff in the scantily dressed outfit, which accentuated her finer assets. And in her hands was a scrumptious slice of Dutch apple pie with scoops of ice cream piled all over it. And Susie says, oh, I've missed you, Biff. If you come with me, you can have me and all this, too. No way, Biff said to Susie. Oh, why not, she pouted. He said, because I am a runner. Now, I want you to think a little deeper about that little story. Let me ask you a question. What was the difference between the Biff at the beginning and the Biff at the end? What happened to his overzealous sexual drive for women and eating? Isn't it the same Biff who would pack away three hamburgers at a time and eat buckets and buckets of chicken wings with no consideration for anything? The difference was Biff's perspective of himself had changed. He no longer saw himself as just a bundle of sex drive and a need to eat under the table anybody who challenged him. Now Biff had become a disciplined runner. He came to the tournament for a purpose, not just to run the race, but to win the race. And that was his new purpose. Who he was, was no longer who he is now. You're going to learn over the course of this series that I think the reason so many Christians fail to move on in their Christian maturity is because they have wrong perceptions of who you are in Jesus Christ. Most people need to see themselves as God sees them. And truth be told, the fault lies with us pastors who have not been sharing this to the people in the pews. And I am so glad I've had been getting this opportunity right from the outset to share this wonderful news with you that you can have a different self-perspective based on the Word of God of who you are in Jesus Christ. In short, we don't see ourselves the way God sees us for the most part. And therefore, many of us suffer with poor images and depression and so many things that uh, just come upon us as human beings. Christians too often identify ourselves with Adam, not the new Adam, Jesus Christ, uh, the old Adam in the Garden of Eden. And so many of us Christians live like Biff, chasing and eating with little care to the overwhelmed well-being and a focus in our lives. So let me talk about that for a moment because many of you not, may not understand what I'm talking about when I say the last Adam and the new Adam in Jesus Christ. I just want to briefly clarify this for you. We know the story of Adam and Eve is given to us in the book of Genesis, particularly in the first four, four chapters of, uh, of Genesis. And too often we understand and see ourselves in relating to this Adam as the one who was expelled from the garden. And we can't seem to stop sinning and therefore, of course, naturally, we belong outside the garden because we're, dis we're displeasing to God. And though, we be we'll, and though we'll begin to learn how God sees us as Christians, we will still have a hard time forgiving ourselves and not sitting outside the garden. I know that because I struggle with forgiving myself at times as well. But let me tell you something. Yes, you have inherited a physical life from Adam. 
But if you are a Christian today, believe it or not, that is where the similarities with the Adam in the garden end. No longer are we outside the kingdom of God. We are welcomed inside God's kingdom. Somehow, we don't understand how, what all this means, uh, this side of glory, but somehow, Ephesians says, we are seated in the heavenlies with God. Today, right now. I don't know how that works. I don't completely understand it. We won't until we enter glory. But God, being rich in His mercy, Ephesians says, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Somehow, right now, we are seated in the heavenlies, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. So the difference between the two Adams is very profound. We need to identify ourselves with Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Not the Adam of the Garden of Eden. So what does this mean practically for you and I? Well, I'm glad you asked. The first thing we notice about Christ, the last Adam, is his complete dependence on God. The first Adam depended on God until he started to rebel. He started to question God. Jesus, on the other hand, he never wavered. Uh, Jesus was totally dependent on God. As a matter of fact, Jesus makes the claim in John 5.30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. John 6.57, I live because of the Father. John 8.42, I proceeded forth and have come from God, and I have not even come on my own initiative, but He sent me. And John 14.10, the words I say to you are not just my own, rather the Father living in me, doing His work. Jesus was completely surrendered to God, completely dependent on God. Will we ever be completely dependent on God? I don't think so. We are human beings and we haven't reached glory yet. So I think we will still sin, but we are at the same time not excused from not trying to be holy from not trying to reach dependence on God. When we uh, live independently of God, we are sinning, just like Adam and Eve did. But that's a choice. That's a choice. And these are things that are completely opposite to what our culture is trying to uh, instill within us. Culture tries definitely to live independent of God. We don't need a God according to culture today. We are saying, not only do we need God, but we are dependent on Him. Even when Jesus was starving, during His temptation after His baptism in the desert, Jesus, uh, Satan tempted Him to turn uh, the stones into bread, and Jesus replied, Man shall not, not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And when Jesus' ministry here on earth was coming to a close, he said in John 17, 7, Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. In short, what we take from all this is that Jesus modeled for us what it means to be 100% wholly dependent on God the Father. And so that is my first point for you this morning. I want us to learn about the second Adam, Jesus Christ, is that he, and therefore so should we, be dependent upon God. Second thing I want us to learn is that we have a spiritual life. When the first Adam was born, he was born uh, physically and spiritually alive. But when he chose to rebel and live independently of God, he died spiritually. And therefore, every person born since then has inherited 
this spiritual death. There was one exception to that rule. And that exception was Jesus Christ. Jesus, like the first Adam, was born spiritually alive as well as physically alive. And that is one of the reasons I have absolutely no trouble with the birth, believing in the virgin birth. Because he had to be born spiritually alive, conceived of the Spirit of God, in order to replace the failing first Adam. And Jesus didn't keep his spiritual life a secret. In John 6, 48, he said, I am the bread of life. In John 11, 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 1, 4, he said, in him was life, and the light was the life was the light of men. <clears throat> now in his resurrected, glorified body, God, Christ, lives on today for all eternity. Now, you need to know something. As I was preparing my sermon this week and got this far in my preparation, I began to realize I don't have time to finish. But this was important information to understand next week. So I just want to make one more brief point today, and next week I'll finish off uh, what I hope I could have done today, but I don't have time. The last point I want to make is what a difference Christ makes in us. The difference between the first Adam and the last Adam is the difference between life and death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, As in Adam all died, so also in Christ all should be made alive. Now, I want you to notice two words in that short little verse. And those two words are in Christ. And those two words are the reason why I had Angela read Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians talks a great deal about being in Christ Jesus. Now, some translations may use a different word, but the meanings are the same. Ephesians is very rich on the teachings of you and I being in Christ Jesus. I think everything that we are going to talk about over the next coming weeks is based on the fact that we as believers are in Jesus Christ. Being in Christ and all that it means as to Christians in maturity and freedom is the overwhelming three theme of the New Testament. For example, in the six chapters of Ephesians, there's only six chapters. Go home and read, you're going to find out there's 40 references to us <laughs> being in Christ. 40 references in six chapters. I bet you never noticed that before. I didn't until I counted them up. For every reference for Christ being in you, there are ten for you being in Christ. Go home and check it out for yourself this week. Read your Ephesians. Being in Christ is the most critical element of your identity in, in us Christians. All right. It's going to be a little shorter this week. In order to do the next week, what I want to do, but I need to talk about this uh, to get you prepared for next week. Uh, let me encourage you to go home this week and read Ephesians for yourself. Get the whole picture at once. It's really exciting. And take note of all the in Christ or in Him, whatever uh, two words are st struck together in your translations, and you will just be blessed and amazed at how much uh, Paul tries to tell us, folks, we're in Jesus Christ. So as we learn from my opening illustration of Biff, whose identity changed as his life goals had changed, so too can our lives be changed as we begin to see ourselves in Jesus Christ. So who do you see yourself as today? You're going to have to 
you've learned something about me that I believe very strongly. There's a gate through him out there, or chorus, whatever you want to call it. I'm a sinner saved by grace. You probably know it. Wonderful song. I love the tune. But theologically, it is incorrect. You are no longer a sinner. You are a saint who sins. There's a difference. You are a saint who sins. I hope you see yourself as a saint. But as like Biff's perspective had changed about his identity, so too will our identity begin, begin to be changed and molded throughout this certain series. And so may we know the in Christ and may our behaviors begin to change because of who we are in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, I thank you what you did for us at Calvary. I thank you that you modeled for us what it means to be dependent upon God the Father. I pray as we leave here we will begin to see who we are as Christians, truly. How your love has reached out to us and how we respond to your love every day of our lives with the choices we make. May you just uh, bless us as Christians as we begin to grow in the depths of understanding of who we are in you. May it cause us uh, to grow spiritually and grow mature in maturity as well. And be thankful for who we are in you. We pray in Christ's name.
angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 